So we're going to continue our series on discipleship. And, you know, I want to tell you, if, uh, if you happened, even if you, even if you didn't miss, if you want to hear the sermon again, I would ask you to go on our website. We're trying to get those, the, the sermons up for the last couple of them. I know one is up. Does this, did the second, they're all current. So that's great. So because they build on one another. We started the series in Romans 12, 1 about tra- the transformation of a disciple. And that just because you come to church doesn't make you a disciple. I don't have to use the McDonald's analogy, do I? Just by going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger. Just by coming to church doesn't make you a disciple. And so I, I want to just uh, remind us all of that and, and to challenge us, where are we in our walk with the Lord? Some people have been Christians their whole life. They were born and raised in church and have never truly followed God and never submitted themselves and surrender. Rather than submit, I say surrender to the will and the way of Almighty God for their lives. And the sad part is they will never know if they ever fulfilled their purpose in the Lord because they haven't been following his purpose. They've been following their own. Tough talk, huh? But you know what? If if we can't be honest here, where can we be honest? We have to look at our own lives in the light that Christ shines upon us and say, where do I stand? Am I just an attender? Am I somebody that is just saved? You know, salvation is a free gift from God. Sanctification costs us. You know, the the Lord said, if you want to be my disciple, you have to deny yourself. In other words, you have to die to yourself and to those things, those plans that you have, those ideas, those great plans, and put it all on the altar. In that, you will see that God will take you from where you thought you were going to where you are now. It's a a true transition, a true uh, transformation, if you will. In Greek, it's uh, metamorphi, which is metamorphosis, that we go from glory to glory. And metamorphosis is what happens between a caterpillar and a butterfly. And so right now we are entering into our third uh, uh, sermon in this series. And I want to go to a, an example of a disciple. And I want to go to the disciple of Timothy. And uh, I'm going to give you a lot of background. Now, um, let me just tell you a little bit about Timothy. We first hear about Timothy in the book of Acts. And uh, we find that Timothy uh, is there on Paul's first missionary uh, uh, journey uh, in the city of Lystra. And Timothy's very unique in the scriptures. Timothy's grandmother, um, Timothy's grandmother, and his mother uh, was um, Eunice, and his grandmother was, oh my goodness, this is, what is that? Oh, you forgot. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it someplace. I, what is that? Uh, no, it was, it was Eunice, and Eunice was his mother, anyway. I'll, I'll, it'll come to me by the end of this thing. So, um, so Eunice was his mother and his grandmother. Lois was his grandmother. Eunice was his mother. Oh, it takes a while, but it comes in, you know. Um, they were devout believers in the Lord. They were saved when they heard about, about the message of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, and the great salvation that he brings. Paul, on his first missionary journey, he finds uh, this family, and they are open and willing, and they raise uh, their heads and accept the Lord Jesus, and, and they are strong. Timothy sees the faith of his grandmother and his mother, and there is just a call in his heart. Nothing's going to hold him back. And he becomes a devout follower of the Lord Jesus on Paul's first missionary journey. And in that time, he becomes, he hears what the Lord has taught and he puts it immediately into, act, into action. He didn't have somebody constantly with him, although there were leaders, but 
He knew that what he heard was the truth. And that, you know, the scriptures teach that the Holy Spirit will teach us all things. When I was in the convent, the Holy Spirit taught me about salvation and about knowing Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I certainly had no teacher there telling me about it, but I had heard the word on that very strange Wednesday night service when I wandered into a Pentecostal church and I heard the story that we're saved by grace and and never thought of it again until that time in the scriptures when I found that old Bible that that pastor challenged me to take and I heard and I read and the Holy Spirit began to quicken my heart. And there were things that happened while I was in the convent where I was getting rid of dogma and doctrine that what didn't didn't fit what I was reading. And, and here I am. I'm wearing a habit, for goodness sakes. And, but things are happening in my head that I know are true. And that's what happened to Timothy. His background is his mother and his grandmother were Jewish. He was, he was, uh, and his father was Greek. So his father was pagan. Interesting. So the next missionary journey that ha- comes by, Paul comes by, and he finds Timothy, this devout young man. And Paul sees something in him that the Lord will use. He sees his heart. Uh, So today, where's our heart? If if Paul walked in, would he say to you, uh, come, I want to, I want you to be truly a fisher of men. Uh, Would, would Paul see something in us that would give him a glimmer of hope? Some things happened at the very beginning in Timothy's life. You know, if you read, and you know, I want to just say as a little, uh, as a little announcement and an advertisement, uh, we're going to start Bible study up in a little while, in a few weeks, um, maybe in February. Not, I don't think I can do it in January, but starting perhaps in the beginning of February. And we're going to, we're going to get into, uh, the pastoral epistles, which are first and second Timothy, uh, Titus, um, uh, and uh, I believe uh, both Thessalonians. So, uh, but so we're not going to talk much about doctrine in the books of Timothy today. I want to talk about the person of Timothy. So Timothy has built up a reputation in his community and around uh, that area that he is that he is a Christian in every sense of the word. word. He loved people. He was kind to people. He was a young man, not real young, but I mean, back in those days, he would be considered young. You were considered uh, a young man until you were 40. Timothy was probably, when all this was first starting, uh, in his 20s. And so he follows Paul and Silas, and they go out on that second missionary journey. During that time, Paul is challenging Timothy all, in, in all ways. Challenging him how he's thinking, how he's acting, his behavior, what is going on. And there's something that happens between the teacher and the student. That's discipleship. What happens with Timothy and Paul is that there's a true discipleship. Now, Timothy is a disciple of Jesus, but he looks at Paul, for example. He looks at Paul for what is, what is uh, most important in his walk. And in that relationship, things began to emerge. Do you know Timothy uh, was just was never circumcised because his father was pagan and his mother never pushed the, the situation. Paul says to Timothy, "I think you should get circumcised." He's a grown man, and Timothy says, "Okay." Now. He didn't ask why. He didn't say, well, maybe. Uh, is there a doctor in the house? No, Paul did it himself. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, you're right, Nellie. Whoa. But it was an act of submission. Now, Titus had similar a similar background, but Titus was never uh, circumcised by Paul. But there was something about that circumcision that made Timothy and, and Paul even closer. Because Timothy put it all on the altar. He had nothing to hold back. I don't know how we are in all of this. But I want to tell you that if we're holding anything back from the service of the Lord, 
we become only attenders and never disciples. Never disciples. And I want to tell you, it comes, we come to a moment of decision and we ask ourselves, what is it, Lord? What is it? On this uh, second missionary journey, they go all over the place, from Macedonia to, to uh, 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 Ephesus to Philippi, and then back to Ephesus, where Paul, the, the church in Ephesus that Paul had started got very big very quickly, but their doctrine was a mess. They had begun to listen to the Judaizers who, who told them that they had to uh, follow the law and then they could become Christians. And that was completely opposite from what they decided in Jerusalem. And so, so here Timothy is with Paul and they get to Ephesus and Paul stops and says, Timothy, I need you here. I need you here. Timothy was never a pastor before. He was just a disciple. And you know, I don't know about you, if you've ever been challenged by the Lord and you find yourself in a position where you are out of your league or you're in deep water. Ever been in deep water? And you, you, you know God's brought you here, but you're in deep water. I want to assure you that the Lord brought you to that deep water to teach you exactly what you need to know in that deep water. And there's Timothy now. He's heading the church. And not only that, Paul gives him a letter of, of uh, authority for that church. And he's a young man. He's been with Paul now seven years. But still a young man. And there are people in that church who didn't go, Oh, Timothy, we've been waiting for you. They saw this young guy uh, coming in as an authority figure. And, oh, There was a lot of trouble. But what Timothy had gone through in his life prepared him for that moment. Timothy put his arms around the church and people began to become committed to that body. He he began to explain the truths that, that were taught by Jesus himself and that were reiterated by Paul. And people began to rise up and say, Hey, this is our pastor. This is this is the guy. Paul writes, 1st and 2nd Timothy, they are, I believe, 1st and 2nd Timothy are probably the most personal letters, epistles, you'll find in the New Testament. They are filled with Paul talking to a spiritual son and giving him direction and letting him know. Now, there's, it's not without controversy. When you come to Bible study on Timothy, listen, there's a lot of things in First and Second Timothy. He, Timothy sets up the, the, the structure of the church with elders and deacons. Uh, uh, and, he, and gives strict qualifications for teachers and for evangelists. Five-fold ministry is explained in, uh, through Timothy. Timothy follows exactly what the Lord does. But it's not a matter of the law. It's a matter of the heart. Now I want to talk about us for just a few minutes uh, on our walk as, as true disciples of the Lord. All of us come from different backgrounds, and yet we find ourselves here together this morning. Some of us have had a very long history following the Lord and being committed. And some of us came on board in the last few years. Some of us have never really given over our lives to Jesus. We sing the songs and we clap our hands. We might even give a praise to the Lord once in a while. But to be honest and truthful, we have not really submitted ourselves to the will of God. Whether we're frightened of it, you know, sometimes it's not that we're really rebellious but we just think we've got a better idea. Isn't that funny? The Lord of all creation. And we go, no, I, I, I got this, Lord. You, I don't need you in this. But we do. We find ourselves now at a real crossroads. Because I want to tell you something, that from this Sunday on, you know, not everybody will follow the teachings of a disciple. Some will continue to come and we love you and you just keep coming. You just keep coming. It's okay. But some of us have a call in our lives to go forward. A call in our life that we would commit ourselves no matter what. I want to tell you just a couple of things. Let me just uh, um, share with you just a couple of things. 
what, it, what qualifies someone to be a disciple? The first thing I want to tell you, it's your heart. If there's a yeah, but in your vocabulary, you disqualify yourself. Yeah, but I couldn't be crazy. Yeah, I, I don't want people to think I'm nuts. Yeah, but, yeah, but. You disqualify yourself. The Lord hasn't put that on you. You have put yourself and limited your view and limited God and limited where and when you can be used by Almighty God. See, a disciple, there's no limit. Timothy had never pastored a church. I never thought I was going to pastor a church. And here I stand. So when we come in uh, to say truly in our hearts, Lord, I want to be your disciples. What does Jesus say? He says, you got to leave all those things to me. Remember last week we talked about the person that he says, the Lord says, you know, if you don't hate your mother and father and sister and brother and kids, then you're not worthy to be my disciples. And what he was saying, that nothing can be above your relationship with him. That's the truth. I I can't water it down. I can't say, well, if you're 75% committed, you're okay. No. Listen, the scripture is the scripture. And the scripture says that you have to be willing to put God first. That's our heart, that we would put God first. Now, do we fall and make, make mistakes, and do we choose still choose sometimes to follow our own ways? Yes, but you know what? We recognize that that's not how it's supposed to be. And so we, we repent, we come back into a relationship to the Lord, and we move on going forward to that discipleship. We all fall short, but it's settled in our heart that we want to have God as our number one. It's amazing when God is in that place in our life, we will have experiences that we've never had before. We will have uh, 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 encounters that we never thought possible, and he can lead us if he is first in our lives. So that's the first thing. So my challenge to you is, who is God in your life? Is he number one, or does he come after, you know, the dog? (laughs) Where is God in your life? I am the Lord thy God. Have no other gods before me. God has to be number one before we do anything. If you want to be a disciple. If you want to be an attender, we love you. Have a cup of coffee, relax. But... If you want to be a disciple, I have to tell you, God must be number one in your work, in your family, in your relationship, no matter when you face a challenge, no matter if you're going through a, a, a difficult uh, uh, time in your life, God still has to be number one. The second thing I want to tell you is that um, that our heart must be his, our mind must be his. Now see, sometimes they're, they're two very different things. Corrie Ten Boom was a woman who uh, was imprisoned uh, during Nazi Germany in a concentration camp. She was a Christian. She was arrested. She and her family were arrested for hiding Jewish children. And uh, uh, she and her family went to a concentration camp. Her father was immediate, and father and mother were immediately killed. Uh, her uh, older sister by a few years uh, eventually died in the concentration camp and uh, she was finally liberated when the allied forces uh, came in and devout Christian her whole life put her life and her family's life were all on the line to follow Christ she when I was a very young Christian the Lord uh, had me she came to Connecticut a number of times and I went every time she came because there was something. Now, she was, like, would you, if you ever thought, well, what would a, 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 a German woman uh, kind of look like? She, she was not a small woman. She was a larger woman. She had her hair braided and came up like this. And she talked with a very German accent, you know. And it was hard to understand at first until you got into it. Corey Ten Boom said that some people miss heaven by 18 inches, the distance from the heart to the head. And when we talk about the mind of Christ, we talked about the first week in Romans 12.1, we're talking about that division. 
We might, in our heart, we might, in our prayer time when we came to the Lord, there might have been a, a rush in our heart. Oh, I love you, Lord. I'll do anything for you. Oh, I love you, Lord. You know, and that first week we're like, whoo, I'm a child of the King. I'm a child. Step aside, devil. I'm a child of the king. And we kind of walked around like that in that honeymoon period. I told you, we'd pray for dead cats. We'd pray over our car if there wasn't enough gas in the car. And you know, the Lord, I'm sure, smiled at all of that. But there was a time coming when we were going to have to see what we were made of. And some Christians fell away right away. You know, it's like the, it's like the sower goes out to sow his seed. And some of it falls on the rocky road of the path. Some some of the seed falls amongst the thorns and it grows up a little bit. Some falls in the rocks. Some Christians, that's what happens. The first difficulty, they're back out partying with the boys or, or doing whatever. If we are true disciples of Christ, we need to understand that our mind must be transformed. What does that mean? It means we have what would... Jesus think. Not only what would Jesus do, you know, the little bracelets, what would Jesus do? But what would Jesus think? Somebody sent me a um, a thing on Facebook about a pastor who recently ended up having to get divorced. And I don't really know the whole story, but uh, the pastor was on and trying to, you know, talk about his situation and defending kind of his his situation and my heart broke because I, I I could feel the pain in his heart I could sense the sorrow in his soul that he's going through this divorce but I want to tell you and I and I was very it was very impor- important for me to stop watching this video and and close my eyes and start to pray for that guy and his ex-wife. I am not, I am telling you that the mind of Christ breaks for people who are in sin, especially those that have been walking with him and they fall short. They, they fall off uh, this relationship. How can the Lord trust us if we're falling every single time? There has to be a discipline in our lives to become a disciple. And the discipline comes and says, I am going to think as Christ. Now, there's a lot of times when people do things to us, they say things to us, they say things about us, they judge us. But the Lord says, don't be like one of those. What does that mean? That means that we hold our judgments. We pray for those. Listen, if, if I say something today, and maybe you already have, that you don't like and you're mad at me, understand that. I understand. Want to talk to me about it? Sure. But more important than talking to me about it, I want you to pray for me. If I'm an error, I want you to pray for me. And don't you want me to pray for you if you're an error? Don't be judging you, not being exposing you, not saying, oh, well... Our mind, we have to begin to think like Christ. You know, the scriptures teach that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. It's almost as if they were running a marathon race. And you know, in that marathon race, when that runner runs into the stadium, after he's already run 24.5, is it, miles? I don't know exactly who. I would never know that exactly. But... Thank you so much, Jenna. Oh, Mike knows. (laughs) Mike knows. (laughs) So as they're running back into that stadium, everybody's on their feet. Everybody's exhausted. How could you run 26.2 miles and not be exhausted? I'd be crying. Ah, One more step, Lord. One more step. But the people are standing up cheering. Come on. You can do it. You're there. Keep going. Don't you stop. Remember last week we showed the, we showed the film from, uh, the clip from, uh, uh, facing the giants, right? With the, with the coach encouraging the young man, come on, five more steps, four more steps, come on. <coughs> I want to tell you, that's the cloud of witnesses. That's what's going on in heaven. Every single time we face a decision, every single time we feel like we, we don't have the, the heart to go on, every single time that we fall and we're trying to get up, they're saying, come on, get back up, come on. And not only them, the Lord himself is like, come on, I, I got your hand, Vicky. come on, get up, get up. Don't wallow in that mud for another second. Get up, you're my child. That's a disciple. Not that they don't fall. 
But they understand that there's a support to bring them back up. And they keep going. Some of us are facing difficulty this this day. This week is going to be rough. This month is going to be rough. Whatever. I want to tell you, we keep going. Disciples keep going. They keep going. They have already, in their mind and in their heart, paid the cost. They said, no matter what, I will keep going with you, Lord. You are in the top spot. You are in the first position. You have my heart. You have my mind. I'm not going to be thinking about all this baloney that people are saying about me. I'm not going to worry what this one is thinking about me. I'm going to do what's right. You know, I, ha- I have to come to that, con- that, that sta- statement every Sunday morning. Lord, no matter what, no matter if people walk out on me, no matter what, I've got to preach your word. That's what you called me to do. And let me tell you something, whether you're behind this pulpit or out uh, on the workforce, that's exactly what you're called to do too. To stand strong and preach the word and your life is an example. That's the, uh, the next thing I want to say to you. He transforms us. And what we love. He transforms us. You know, there was one time when we all loved the things of the world. We loved the, the money, the, the jewelry, the, the, the cute guy on our arm, uh, the cute girl on my other, uh, the other arm, whatever. You know, that people were trophies. Our relationships were trophies. You ever been around somebody who's a big name dropper? Oh yes, I, I, me and, uh, me and President Trump, like this, you know. Why do they do that? Why do they feel they have to qualify themselves when they talk to us? It's because they lack the security of knowing who they are and whose they are. Not so with a disciple. A disciple stands. He knows exactly who he is under the umbrella of Almighty God. God is his Father. He stands in submission to to Jesus and he goes forward knowing who he is, knowing who he belongs to. No matter what, we know that God is for us. Our affection then becomes that we would love the Lord more. And guess what? As we love the Lord more, we love each other more. Judgments go down the tubes. Uh, critical spirits go away. The gossip ends. Why? Because God is in front of us. And as we go closer to God, those that are walking with us, we grow closer to each other like the spokes of a wheel. And that discipleship is the walk that people see all around us. They may not see our heart. And they may not see our mind. But they will definitely see our love. They will see how we love one another. They will see that we stand for the Lord. They will see. Let me tell you something. So, uh, people always ask me this question. Because I don't drink. You know, it's, it's not that I have like this big, I'm not carrying signs or anything. You know, none of that stuff. But when, uh, I, it's just a personal kind of thing. And it's not that it's a hard and fast rule, but I, 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 I I don't really drink. I mean, I not to. I don't. I don't think that. I can't remember the last time I had a glass of wine. But my point is this: there's a reason why I don't. And you know, I was at a party uh, about six years ago or seven year, uh, years ago, and I was with a bunch of friends. And there was a, they had closed the restaurant down, and they were it was just for this party. And so it was great. You know, we were having a great time. And um, I went up. They had uh, uh, an open bar, and and so I don't even. It's it's awkward for me. It's my generation, I think, for me to go up to the bar. I'm not crazy about that, but but nobody was around, so I just went up to the bar to get a soda. So I'm there, and I uh, said to the bartender, um, "I'll have a diet coke." And and standing at the bar having a drink was this woman, and she goes, "You're Pastor Vicky, right?" And I said, "Yeah," and she said. I got to talk to you. And she's drunk. And she begins to tell me the story of her life. You know, crying and carrying on. And you know what? That night, I had thought about getting a glass of wine. Is it, was it a big deal? No. Well, it was not a big deal. I don't judge. If I, if I see you in a restaurant and you have a glass of wine, don't put it under the table. <laughs> have a glass of wine, whatever, wherever the Lord is, is bringing you. But at that moment, I, I something happened in my heart and it said if you 
How could you have truly, how could she have possibly heard you truly if she could smell alcohol on your breath? That ended it for me, really. It was just something in my own heart that I said, you know, and I don't judge anybody. I've said this now three times. Don't walk out of here saying, Pastor Vicky's judging me because I have a glass of wine with dinner. I didn't say that. I just said for me, I knew that that was the call that I needed to, to walk. Timothy went through the same thing. Timothy didn't drink to the point when he had a stomach thing. The, the water back then, it wasn't purified like it is now. Well, we hope it is anyway now, but uh, it, it wasn't. It was You could really catch bacteria and stuff like that. Timothy uh, was drinking water, and the problem was he was getting these stomach things going on. And so Paul says, take a little wine for your stomach's sake. Paul said that. You know, the people watch us all the time. I'm not talking about alcohol here. I'm talking about your life walking in Jesus. The love that you show to one another. The times that you extend yourself when it's not convenient. The times when when people say, hey, I'm sorry I called you, but I really don't know what to do in this. And you respond. As a matter of fact, you have to change your plans so you can help them. That's when you know you're really following the Lord. Because it costs something. It costs something. For you to get out of your bed at, you know, 10 o'clock at night, nice and cozy, and somebody's going through something, and you say, I'll be there in 15 minutes, and you get dressed and you go. Or, check your checkbook. Are you a follower of the Lord? What does the Lord say about our money? It's His. It's His. Check your checkbook. Find out. Who are you giving your money to? Well, I give to the church. Good, good. I'm glad you give to the church. But are you giving it all unto the Lord? No, he doesn't want it all. He just says 10%. Well, what about the person that needs uh, new shoes or a new coat? Are you willing to go beyond that? You see, a disciple's love is one of the signs of true discipleship. How's our transformation of affection? We have a a change in our will. Our will is no longer to do what we want to do. Our will is no longer, I've got all these plans, Lord, and if you just help me get through my plans... That's not, the, that's not the prayer of a disciple. A prayer of a disciple says, Lord, show me what you want. I'm going to take this next step. Lord, I'm not sure if I'm, not sure if I'm ever going to be a teacher. But Lord, I feel you're calling me to go and get my certification. I'm just taking this step, Lord. Lord, I don't know if you called me to be an EMT, but Lord, I'm going to take the next step. I'm going to take a class. Lord, I don't know what you want from me, but I'm just going to take the next step into cemetery, a seminary. <laughs> I don't know, Lord. I'm just taking the next step. <laughs> and what a long step that was. <laughs> hey, I want to tell you something. I've invited... Uh, a young man, he's a lot younger than I am, uh, to come and share with us uh, at the end of the month on the 26th or whatever the last Sunday is, Paul Pace. He's a crazy man. Um, and uh, so I just want you to know we're going to have a visitor. He was with me in seminary. so uh, And <laughs> he was always the guy going, come on, come on, Vic, come on, we could do this. No, we can't. Yeah, yeah, we can do this. So you'll want to be here for it. Um, but the thing is, is that God just calls us We don't have to see the whole road. We just take the next step. The next step that God has given us. I don't know where it's going to lead. But my will is not my own anymore. And I feel I'm supposed to take this step, so I'm going to do it. Lord, stop me. Put put up roadblocks. But if you've called me to it, I'm going to go to it. And not the not I have to say this. It's sometimes it's not an easy road, even though God's called you to it. So all you do is you just take the next step. The only reason why I finished seminary was because he never released me out of seminary. It was like a sentence that you got, you know, and was standing before the judge, you know. No, you can't leave yet. Can I go now, God? No, you can't go now. 
And here I stand. So God will turn our affection. He will turn our will to his. In our relationships. And our purpose is no longer our purpose. But it's God's. Today, as we talked, you know what, uh, Daniel, would you pull up that that, uh, uh, call to worship that you had? And would you stand and read it again, please, and give us the reference? It's in 2 Timothy, I believe. Four eighteen. Go ahead. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. The Lord will rescue us. Disciples have a, a, a relationship to God that nobody can understand. That you we can go through things resting in his arms, being carried by him through difficulty rejoicing in our sorrow, rejoicing when things are good. There is a relationship there that we have never experienced until we settle in our heart that we are disciples of Almighty God. He will rescue us. He will cover us. He will keep us under the pinion of his wing. And he will be with us through every victory. And we're not done yet. Next week we'll close up our discussion on on being a disciple. But I challenge you this week. My points, let me uh, restate them just quickly. He wants our heart. He wants our mind. He wants our loves, our affections, the things that, that, that make us love one another. He wants our will. And he deserves our purpose. So this week, Let's continue to search God's will. Let's get closer to him. Keep praying for the church. Keep spending time with him. And you know, can I tell you this? There were three things about Timothy that we have to remember for our own lives. First of all, Timothy uh, loved the word of God sat under the teachings of Paul, and when Paul wasn't there on the fir- after the first missionary journey, he sat under the teachings of his mother and his grandmother, who told him all about the things of Jesus. He was a student of the Word. And they didn't have the written Word. We, the, they estimate the, that the first and second Timothy was probably, they have two suggested, suggested times. One is between uh, 55 A.D. and uh, 50 and 55 A.D. and 65, 60 and 65 A.D. They, they can't be sure because of Paul, uh, Paul's arrest and, and uh, uh, awaiting uh, death. Yeah. But we know that, that the Lord has called us to walk in our own way, in our own path, rather, for discipleship. Timothy uh, loved the word of God. The second thing is he surrendered himself to the teachings of Paul. Paul and Timothy were like father and son. When you read First and Second Timothy, there is a relationship there that is so beautiful. My son, he calls him. My child, he calls him in places. He, there is that. And he, Timothy, sees Paul, sees Paul as his father in the Lord. Paul is in jail. He's going to die in the end of 2 Timothy, a short time, a week or two after. And he sends this letter of 2 Timothy to Timothy, and he says, come and visit me. I long to see your face again. He said, when you come, bring my winter coat, because it was so cold in that prison, you know. A short time later, Timothy, uh, before Timothy could get there, he dies. See, that relationship between teacher and And disciple is so critical. So critical. And finally, because of the person that God created him to be, Timothy's mother was a Christian, uh, and uh, was a Jew, and then a Christian, and Timothy's father was a Greek. Timothy was able to adapt wherever he was. Sometimes we go, well, I can only, I can only talk to uh, these people. Uh, I, I'm good pastor around church folks. It's those people in the world. 
Have you ever meet someone like that? Oh, how, you know, they just drive me crazy, those people in the world. Well, who did you think Jesus came to save? Don't be a jerk, <laughs> right? Jesus came to save us all. And Timothy had that ability to adapt wherever he was. If he was with the pagans, he was able to share Christ in a way that they could hear. He didn't go into all of the, the minute uh, uh, intricacies of, the, uh, of salvation and, and theology and all of that, but he was able to communicate to the Greeks. He was able to communicate to the people around him. He was able to flow with the Jews. And that's why the Lord could use them. Be open. Some people say, I can never talk to them. They've got too much money. If you're in their presence, the Lord wants you not only to talk to them about Jesus, but to be Jesus. If you're if you're talking with somebody who, who's poor and who can't make ends meet and maybe has an addiction, God, if you're talking to that person, God's equipped you to tell them the gospel and that there's deliverance in the Lord Jesus. Not to hold back. Not to hold back. Go with God. Let's all stand. So, Father, we come to you, Lord. We are at different points in our walk with you, Lord. But we're at the same point in that we want to be a disciple. So, Lord, once again, we put ourselves on the altar. We surrender our purpose, our will, our mind, our heart. Father, our affections, and we submit ourselves to you, Lord. Lord, keep us, Lord, hold us. Lord, walk with us. And if we fall, Lord, encourage us to get up again and walk with you. Father, we love you this day. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would touch everyone in this place, that you would meet their needs and that you would encourage their hearts, Lord, and they would know how much you love them. And Father, we pray, Lord, that you would guide our path. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, everybody.